Guten Morgen. Hi, good morning, everybody. I welcome you to the second day, first talk on this stage. Um, it's, well, it's quite early. It's still in the middle of the night for some of us, I believe. Um, but yeah, I'm Peter. I'm the herald for today's talk of Camille. And uh, Camille is with us. Good morning, Camille. And good morning. We, yeah, Camille is giving us a, a talk about a very interesting idea. Uh, we want to play with words. And actually, this is the first Congress of Camille. So it's the first time he's being on stage and at the Congress. So he's enjoying it so far, I hope. Um, Camille is uh, studying mathematics in Poland. And yeah, I think we will yeah, let you start with your talk. Actually, it's a kind of an interactive session. Um, we have shared, or he has shared a document we can use to follow him in his talk. It will be presented, but I think you can enter actually uh, ideas and comments in the document as well. So please be polite, don't erase anything, otherwise we need to shut it down and then stay with the copy, the read-only copy. So Camille, yeah, so have fun. I, I hand over to you and let's start uh, Yeah, playing with words. I'm really interested to see what you want to talk about today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, so a few words about me. I'm considering mathematics. Before I had a one and a half year or long break, searching for optimal places and researching tons of curiosities. Curiosity, since is one of the reasons I ended up making this talk. Uh, before I was a uh, visual effects artist, artist working in the film industry. And small disclaimer uh, I usually laugh a lot. This is a sign of sympathy uh, and, and, and encountering and entertaining ideas. Uh, so if I will hear some stimulating questions for you and I will laugh, this is a compliment. <laughs> <Don't>... <laughs> yes. uh, so mm, the, this is not only about me, but what what I do, I, I do this with in, in group. So I want to talk about this group a bit. We have five active members. We are from different backgrounds and we playing with words since few months. The main idea of the talk is that I will uh, throw examples of, of what I mean by playing with words and how how we do this. Then I will sum up and make it like more general. Then uh, because we will generalize the topic, we will be able to speculate about this and go like meta. And then uh, I will be waiting for questions. All right, so examples. Here will be uh, a, a pattern through the whole examples session. First, I will introduce a current word or words or phrases and say uh, what we think it's kind of wrong with them. Uh, then I will say how we propose to fix it and perhaps something more uh, because some examples are like rabbit holes, holes and another one are quick and easy. All right, so let's start. Um, first, first phrases like to age and to get old. What we think was, is wrong with it. Like first thing is that these are, at least in my culture, these are charged words, uh, kind of negative. Mm, and they have like basically two, they are two, like two main things people can mean when they say to age. So first thing is that they can mean, they can mean uh, like age in biological terms. So this is the, the, the fourth one, like accumulate cellular and structure damage. As, a, as an anecdote, uh, uh, this is an ongoing debate in uh, sciences. What what does it mean to age? Uh, here is a link for paper. I hope it will load soon. From 2020, which is from December, I think, uh, which is 
exploring what is aging in biological terms. And authors mention a nice thing here, which is, quote, our mental categories tend to correspond to our linguistic categories. So what is how I read the sentence is that we are used to certain categories that words impose on us, and then we expect from reality, from the, our measurements, to match this. But actually, this is often the case that when we go and try to find what is aging, in, even aging, something that seems to be so fundamental and like natural and normal, we find that it's not that generalized. It's, it's, it's harder to generalize and it's actually a few phenomena uh, going on and different species maybe have different weights on different phenomena um, and so on and so on. So yeah, so to age. So one thing when we say to age, we can mean that we accumulate cellular damage. This is like the general, the general biological meaning of this word. But... Uh, but people usually say something different, which is like we expect from others to change in a certain way, like to behave in an odd way, like to not exercise a lot or like, you know, not to learn much. Like the first years university is it's like, a, like universities for uh, people older than like 50, 60, 70 years old are like kind of new thing as far as I know. So we have many, uh, many presuppositions of how, uh, how like people above 50, 60 years old should behave. So then they act with accordance to that. So we think it's kind of nice to separate those two phenomena and like make it clear what we mean. And the third one here is to get unwell as a result of unhealthy lifestyle. So this is kind of between this biological meaning and cultural meaning. Uh, since like most, most causes of deaths in the West are due to unhealthy lifestyle, like smoking cigarettes and diet. So we actually now currently don't die from mostly from, uh, from like accumulation of cellular damage. So we don't, die specifically from aging in biological terms per se, but uh, from, from like what we actually do. Okay, so this is, this is first example. So we basically, when we are inside the group of our, of our like, group with friends, we try to avoid using this term. And if somebody will use this term, we say, hey, what do you mean? And we actually expect from each other to be more precise uh, when we speak about aging, like what we actually mean. And so instead of using shortcuts, we using one of those um, four or more words. Okay, so another 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 word. This work uh, or to work. So the thing is with work is that. Uh, Usually when people say work, uh, they mean to earn money. So volunteering is often not understood as work. Mm, and we kind of don't like it. And uh, like, why is this the case? Because historically speaking, mm, there, were this, there was a distinction and, and like whole culture shift of understanding of work happened in like 19 to 20 century. So now we can feel regret that we don't earn money, that we don't you know, work too much. But actually, because we earn dignity by working and stuff, and we say, like, no, like, let's make it clear. Like, let's split work to work, which is like volunteering, raising children, learning, and so on and so on and labor, which is, strictly speaking, any earning activity. So by this, we want to be more precise about what we mean by work. Uh, and also like shift connotations, because like, ah, now we cannot say, ah, you don't 
you are so lazy, you don't earn money. You know, this sounds ridiculous, but I'm so lazy, you don't work. This this is like normal. <laughs> it's much harder to say, oh, you are so lazy. You don't you don't earn money, you just I don't know, learn or you know, uh, uh, mm, organize something in community, make people happier. Uh, this is considered as, as weird. One of the readings is a like, short essay from uh, by, by guy, guy Standing. Uh, this is a person who is into UBI and stuff. So he obviously likes to uh, write about work. And what he writes is that for many decades, the term in employment was a matter of regret, a recognition of low social status, typically applied to single women obliged to take low-paid positions serving household headed by the bourgeoisie or aristocracy. So this is to underline the, the shift in the, like we have the same word, but the background, but the background, like what are, what are our feelings toward it uh, are completely different. And he also writes a nice thing down here to our context. And this is also the in the same vein. Like now, it's now it's kind of now we earn as citizens, we earn dignity by working. But because working shifts this definition only to money earning activity, uh, we end up that we earning dignity by earning money, and this is like a ridiculous situation, at least for us. Uh, so he's he's basically the author of this essay, advocating that we shouldn't. Uh, like vilified work or not romanticize it. So yes, we propose to uh, <laughs> yeah, I see somebody added uh, yes uh, the, the the physical physical yes of course is a technical term uh, labor as uh, we just make first here, what do we mean by labor money? Mm. Yes, of course, we don't want to erase the physical interpretations of, of work. Uh, we meant it here in culture. This was in background. All right. So let's go to another case. Uh, let Yes, sorry for typos. Mm. So interesting. We propose to ban word interesting. <laughs> so when we are inside our group, we don't use the word interesting, or, the, or at least we try not this word to use this word. Uh, and this is uh, controversial, oftenly when people first heard about it. But let me explain this. So uh, interesting. It, is used in the context when somebody is presenting some idea and you can say it's interesting. So we consider this as meaningless because somebody can say if they are interested or not. Uh, so if the person is really interested in what we are presenting to them, it's, it's obvious. It's like saying, like, this is like people, you know, are... It's, you see by their body language that they're actually interested and want to know more about something you are presenting to them. So it's much better to just ask a particular question, you know, express this enthusiasm just than just mere saying that something's interesting. Okay, another, another example. To like, to have a taste, etc. So uh, actually, this is how the thing with uh, playing with words started. Mm, I read about mere exposure effect. So, uh, mere exposure effect is a kind of bias which says that if you saw something before, there is a much greater probability that you will like it if you will see it a second time, even though you consciously wouldn't remember that you saw for this thing. So I thought, okay, so maybe when people say I like something, they actually mean that they are used to this thing. 
at least in certain at least in certain cases. So then I was speaking with people, and when they say I like, I just inside my brain, it was automatically like they just I, I they say I like like I like Brussels, and in my head I heard I am used to Brussels, and sometimes this being used to make much better sense. And actually, what it does if you replace some occurrence of like to have a taste, you will discover that the, this is much more flexible topic, that it's not that you have to like some something and it's closed. It's, it's under, it's when you say I am used to something, you, you want to underline that what you actually currently like is, is the output of the past, is a product of the past. Thus, you can try to change it like easier. So by changing like to being used to, we try to mm, like underline or highlight that that the the future don't have to be the same as as the past. Uh, what's another thing? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you can make a comments uh, because this is as a definition, but appreciate it. Uh, what, uh, what other thing is that about like is that if you see it, how the frequency of, of like how it's used in a corpus, in the body of language, uh, is that we are, there is a huge spike in the occurrence of like. Of course, some of it can be, uh, can be explained with Facebook. But you see that the liking is sharply uh, increasing even before Facebook. And actually the tempo, you can see this, is very sharp decrease, steady decrease. And Facebook only changed this maybe even more. And I also feel because of that, the pressure to like. And this gives, uh, this, uh, uh, this takes us to another. And this is my personal favorite, which is meta prefix. This is actually a, a, war, a prefix that we created. Uh, so what I wanted to say that, uh, like, like is used more of like, oh, like so often, and I feel like obligated to like so many things. But what actually I would like to is not to like to like things. So this takes us to mm, meta prefix. So here we have examples of meta prefix in war in in action. Mm. So meta prefix is about like self referentialing uh, words. So you can say I like shopping, and then I like to like shopping, and I like to like to like shopping. So with meta prefix, you can make this uh, sentence shorter by adding like to like, which means Mm. or like double like, which is like to like shopping. So it's it's a bit of a headache at the beginning, but then you, yes, yes, somebody, yes, this is, this is, th th this can be done, of course. Uh, so uh, what's, but I'll explain what, I uh, will soon go to why, uh, why making is and, and like making it much more rigid and, and uh, apply the number here. Uh, is, uh, is actually might be a good idea uh, as a way to generate more ideas, but I will go to that soon. Anyway, so we have this meta prefix, which allows us more easy to say like to like shopping. And it's a bit of the headache uh, at the beginning, but then you start to wonder why it wasn't normal before. Like consider the case that you are in the kitchen and preparing Brussels, and dish with Brussels, and the person uh, sits next to you, and you ask them, do you like Brussels? And they answer you, no, I don't like Brussels. So like, what are you supposed to do with this information? What it can is that, do they like Brussels, and do, do they like 
to like Brussels because if they don't like Brussels but don't like to don't like Brussels, this means that they want to change this liking. So with this meta prefix going to, to these directions during, mm. during a conversation is much easier like, because it's just like normalizing. So th this is a term in design affordance, just because something is easy to afford, you do it more often. And it works obviously with negation. And this is also the, a nice question about notation, like what's the best notation for it? Okay, so why uh, why should we, like what, what do we gain uh, by making a number in here? So question the meta prefix generated. Uh, can you go further, like, we like, like to like to like, if you stop and think about it, makes sense. But then you hit a, a ceiling, like like to like to like to not to like is just like complete garbage. So is it because the word itself, the phrase itself loses like meaning or is that it's our limited capacity <laughs> for, so it's, so for humans, it's easy to like, to like, to like, and to like, to like, to like, but, uh, it's harder, you know, you, you, you hit certain uh, ceiling. Uh, okay, so what other things it generated? So it started from liking, but then we generalized it to prefix. So we can think, what are other examples of this meta prefix in use? I find an uh, example with tolerance uh, nice. So, uh, uh, it's a saying that tolerance requires intolerance of intolerance. So in order to have tolerance, you have to have intolerance of intolerance. Uh, so I think this sounds less paradoxical with this meta prefix. Also be used to. So are you used to, to being used to, you know, again, opening to possibilities like, okay, you are used to something, but maybe, mm, your new your addiction is new, so you can ask, are you used to, to being used to? Also to believe, like do you believe that you believe this is this is this is a, a, then we we thought about this belief and then I found uh, reading Smulayan, uh, this is a logician, the mathematician, <clears throat> that uh, he make a whole field of uh, doxastic logic and he, uh, where he wants to categorize type of reason. So a normal reasoner is a person who, while believing P, also believe they believe P. And there is also an opposite one. So uh, while believing P, do not believe P. And this is a well-known paradox in philosophy. So so making this, uh, making this uh, prefix allowed us to like apply this mechanism to the other words mm -hmm. and make it more fun, basically. Uh, and this is the most abstract thus far, and we won't go further, probably. Uh, can we go to the opposite direction? So you see, uh, we use numbers here. So like to like is two like. I like to like to like is three like. So we can obviously go, like we can increase Mm. We can increase this, but can we decrease? So what would be to minus one, to minus two, to minus three, like? So thus far we think this is garbage, but uh, we uh, we keep an eye, maybe some words, we, we would be, would be, it would be applicable, this kind of trick. Mm. Thus far, we have only one example of this, but this requires a bit of introduction. So imagine a language in which uh, like means like to like. So when people using this language which says like, they use like to like, and they just don't use this one like, only to like. Mm. So they could also wonder, can we go to the opposite direction? 
and they would discover that they actually can like things as well. Uh, this one like, not only two likes. So this is this going to opposite direction. And I think a similar things happen already with uh, the word see. So when I say I see a screen and a camera, what I mean exactly is that I am aware of seeing. It's kind of I'm seeing that I see the camera. So to be more specific, like I have a model and <laughs> of myself, which is aware of seeing, and now I see this. But we have blind spot in the eye. So we, in a way, on the on the low level, we see this, but our model of ourselves, our model is making it smoother. So if we agree that uh, that C, that we already using C in this, mm. in this meta prefix way, uh, we can, go to the opposite direction and say that I don't see that I see a blind spot <laughs> because the information is there. It's just being erased before our before it gets to the model. Okay, so because the meta prefix is my favorite, there is a whole big document uh, with, with it and feel free to go there and make a comment. Okay, another word, communitas. This is example of uh, taking back archaic words. This is a an, an, uh, word of a Latin root. Uh, and we find it beautiful. It's, uh, communitas means unstructured community in which pe people are equal. And the second meaning is that the very spirit of community. So yeah, we encourage use of communitas, communitas again. Uh, and we do it. It's not that like we can catch like actually like who cares like we are already doing this <laughs> inside our group. Uh, another one. Oh, this was a quick one. This was uh, before we have examples of erasing words or uh, redefining them and using those definitions. Uh, but now it's an example that we took back archaic word. Okay, another word. This is called. Persian, and this uh, this uh, this word was invented, if I remember correct, correctly, uh, in something like nineties, eighties uh, in New York City by some polyamorous uh, commune. Uh, they felt that they need the opposite of jealousy. So here we have a little diagram. Maybe I, I make it bigger. If somebody have a small screen. So here is uh, my partner. My partner's happiness or success, and my partner's happiness or misfortune. And here is me axis. Uh, me happy, me unhappy. So jealousy is when you are unhappy because your partner is happy. Uh, Shouldn't forget that. Uh, I didn't know this word. It's it's kind of nice word, which is not in English. Uh, I mean, it's just borrowed from. German. Uh, so it's when you are happy that your friend is unhappy. And compassion is when you are happy because your partner is happy. This is usually used in the context of polyamory. So that your partner has had sex with somebody and you are happy, not jealous about this. So uh, this is nice background story. We were just sitting on the balcony and thinking like, wait a minute, what's the opposite of jealousy? Like, can we name it? Like, do we really have to say the opposite of jealousy or inventing a long string of words to, to mean the single thing that is like normal to us? And so we first leave thinking, okay, we have to invent new word. But then I, I search the web and figure out that there is already such a word. And there was a community who also was trying to invent new words and using it. So we just uh, took it. Uh, and this is this was a very nice nice moment, revelation kind of. Uh, and this is a subtle thing now, the subtle remark about this, because we started to thinking about compersion as the opposite of the jealousy, 
but now we're thinking about the jealousy as the opposite of compersion. So by this, we like normalize uh, the word compersion. Uh, so this is the compersion, this is this thing. And the jealousy, ah, this is the opposite of that. And this sheet of words reminds me of adding cisgender to vocabulary to normalize transgender. So again, this is, you know, you're not that weird, you know, uh, because you can be transgender or, and there is no word for that. So they added the words cisgender and this normalized transgender. So this is also so this kind of shifting of weight. Mm. Okay, so now the two easy and quick examples. So the first one is the phrase, Latin phrase, post hoc ergo propter hoc, probably, I probably misspelled this. So we just propose to vulgarize Latin and <laughs> get away with it. It's like before doesn't mean because, end of the story. Don't use Latin. Nobody knows that even academics don't know this language anymore. Uh, and another one is uh, a swearing. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if I can swear here. So I just in, uh, say that this is a sword in order to, this is a phrase to replace being angry towards animals other than human in cities. So one of our friend, uh, one of us uh, spotted that people get angry about animals, but come on, like the whole context about animals in the cities that we built in the city, now we have to figure out the way to live there. So this was traumatizing experience for them. And now we are swearing at them, like, come on. So we prefer to say, I would prefer if pigeons would adapt in other ways to living in a city. All right. So uh, this is the end example. Uh, now I will try, I will uh, sum up what, uh, what those examples were about and also generalize uh, what, what we were doing, what we are doing. So from the linguistics perspective, uh, we are changing most cultural keywords. So we don't change the like primitive words like a group or numbers or place because there is no need for that. They, they are as basic as possible. You probably cannot go and do anything with them. But what we change is the cultural keywords. The words that are charged the words that don't only refer to to like this with this this was the case with with this was the case the case with aging that it's also it's not only a, a word in biological term but it's very much culturally charged and our attempt to change words stems from uh, from the feeling that many things in culture, we just find them ridiculous. So, uh, and these cultural keywords are just um, spreading this ridiculousness. Uh, so we try to change the cultural keywords. The words we find speakers in the community sharing of mental words. So we're making a bubble, a nice bubble for ourselves. Uh, so our goal is to provoke thoughts, promote uh, like perspective, shift of perspective and uh, make us like to, to, to avoid or provide shortcuts because words in like are shortcuts. So we are doing this by uh, by redefining words with building blocks words, this semantic primitives as they are called in linguistics to denormalize. De so for example, country or like nation, this is a one word, but if you start like to define this, it's starting to be like more and more weird and you see more and more opportunities of how 
this could be otherwise. So now everybody are using like nation and it's like very smooth and you can say such a ridiculous thing very quickly. So we are attempting to ban words like this or like change their uh, their meaning, they change their definitions and use the definitions instead of the word. So you have to say what actually country is and make it, it, it makes you, it is to make you think about this a bit more. Yes, so we, we are redefining words using the phrase instead of one word. This is an example. We have much, much more examples before, but let's go another one. Natural. We try not to use the word natural. Natural. This is a buzzword, a weasel word. So uh, we propose to say instead of natural that fits in imaginative order originating from the comfort of the post-industrial world. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So instead of natural, we just have to say this. This whole phrase, uh, because like, what what does it mean? Natural is like no, have no meaning. Uh, we we like to hear this word because we are living in the buildings and we have technology which protects us from nature. That's why it's have good, good connotations. We are reconsidering basis. So, uh, for example. Uh, 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 first person, like we often, the, the use of the first person and to thinking about people as individuals instead of as a group in the context, like it's also inscribed in language. We have grammatical structures to speak about singular, singular individual people, but we don't have struct, grammatical structures to easy and quickly we speak about uh, somebody inside a group or somebody uh, within a, a context. Uh, so one thing we propose is, to, is, an, is a new conduction, which is con, which means in the context of. So we can say I con crowd tend to be withdrawn. So. I con crowd is a singular subject here, which means I in the context of a crowd. So if, and so it's again, affordances, affordance. So because we have this conjunction, it's so easy. Mm -hmm. And the, the, this, this word actually suggests you to use this, use this the, the mere existence of it uh, suggests you to use this. So. Uh, this makes sentences much more precise and not that longer. Okay, we also trying to ban weasel words. Uh, so, so you can see that some rules are similar to the Wikipedia editing uh, rules. Okay, another thing that we are doing is creating new words in order to match them to what we actually do. So this was the case, for example, with this compression word that we have this feeling a lot but there is no word for this feeling so we're making this word no problem and we promote this word as i'm doing right now so uh if you can if it's hard to empathize if it's hard for you to empathize with it you can consider archaic work word amnion this is a Greek word, which means a bowl in which the blood of victims was caught. Like now, for most of us, this word makes no sense. Like we don't have to have a word for this because the use of it is like minuscule. Uh, but but if you are in some subculture, you have the reverse thing. So you want to have like quick words to refer to what are you doing. Mm -hmm. So this is very. This is a regular thing when you work, for example, in some specific domain, and you work with, within a group. So you are making your own shortcuts, your own word, but and we are making it also. But what's different is that that they are not technical terms, but cultural terms. 
So they're not referring to the, sometimes they're not referring to the outside, like to describe quickly some phenomena or some process, but to reflect how do we think. And thus they are shareable. Like I can see, I can say to you what's, what is a comparison and you will understand it and you can actually like start using it. So th this is the difference between uh, like making awards within some specific domain which is not like generalizable. Okay, so we finished the part with examples and make a sum up, like what linguistic, what linguists could say about this, uh, what are patterns that can be spotted, like what, what words are we changing, in what ways are we changing them. Uh, and now we are uh, slowly going to the uh, end, which is shifting between between vocabs, I refer to vocabs as to this, like this, uh, mm. this creative vocabularies, this this body of new words and styles and phrases. So, mm. what do I mean by shifting vocabs? Shifting between the vocabs. So, so consider politics, and we take a cliche example, uh, which is abortion. Mm. So when one side of the political spectrum hear this word, they mean pro-life, and another side of the political spectrum uh, hear pro-choice with this word. So even though the word is one, they are referring to two completely different, two completely different uh, like words, and often there is no intersection between these words, so they are using the same word but speaking of different things. And it's kind of similar to what, like, uh, we have done. Like we are changing the background sometimes behind the words. So you can, um, I, will, I will go back to this one, uh, like. Uh, what else you could do with a vocabulary, with language? You could try to erase nouns. <laughs> okay, this is a very crazy idea, but uh, consider this. Like, uh, your friend is uh, posting on Facebook wall or whatever uh, that, he, that they don't know what to do next and are asking for advice, should I go to the neuroscience to make a PhD and somebody answers why go to neuroscience it's like go there in, it's a bullshit go there in, go to IT instead so what, like this this advice like actually don't mean anything like you don't have any reasons there is no explanation it's just like a sentence that means nothing. It's just like, uh, uh, go to the place like this, the X is bullshit. So you are erasing the noun, like X is bullshit. Go to where I prefer instead. So you can imagine that there is a filter that erases. Here are more examples here in this, in this essay. Uh, you can, you can uh, think it as a filter that filters out certain nouns and making a patterns there. So, so the non becomes, for example, what I like. So don't go to IT, like don't go where I don't like to be, you know, what I don't sympathize with. So the essay is here. And it describes in more details what I mean uh, here. I think the examples it's exactly the same. Yes, should I get the PhD in neuroscience? So the input sentence is, don't go in this neuroscience something, focus on IT instead. So the, the nouns here are like meaningless. Like there is no explanation given, there is no you know meaning in this uh, word, like in terms of advice, having an advice. 
So the output of such a filter without nonce would be don't go into and in square brackets insert what the interloc interlocutor plans to do and add something. And then focus on what speaker sympathize with instead. So this is pretty paradoxical because we erased, uh, erased, you know, we, we erased nouns, or more specifically, we put a placeholders for nouns, and we actually like censor them. And now actually we have a sentence which makes much more sense, which actually conveys the meaning. So this could be also think about some, you know, playing with words, uh, erasing some words and making a generic statements what they actually represent. Mm, in, this this can be applied in some cases. Um, another example of this uh, is the polite type, and uh, this is the initiative in uh, in its infancy. It's like the first stage, and what what they did, what this group uh, did is they created what something which is technically a font. So you can install it on like most machines, most computers. Uh, uh, and this, but this font is not only about look. It's, uh, this this uh, font has find and replace algorithm, like very basic find and replace. They have like tables with thousands of thousands of words that this font is replacing. So if you type with this font, ugly you see you are not yeah, like you are so you see well, let's again you are this font it's not changing this but when you type ugly the phrase not traditionally beautiful this place and if you try to make like swearings here the brewer or or like stuff like that so in the future, they want to replace the simple find and the re re uh, find that find and replace algorithm, which is like totally dumb, with a machine learning and apply it as a font. Uh, so, you c I'm not saying that this is a nice initiative. I I have actually I, I it's interesting theoretically. I have no idea would it work and would the outcome will be. Uh, positive or negative, but consider that the whole idea in this, in its generality, like you have a font which applies certain point of view, so, uh, and it could work from both from the writer and from the viewer. So you could imagine now that you have such a font, which is, you know, make, made from particular subculture. So if you type in this font, you know, natural, it's, it's replace, fit in imaginate order originating from the comfort of the post industrial life. Or you type the opposite of jealousy and it's uh, replace it with compression. Or, you know, uh, you type to work and it's asking you, do you mean to work or to labor? You mean work or labor? So you this is this is very scary, especially if we go back, as I said, that we go back to the politics when mm, you could imagine such filters for uh, for uh, you know the ideologies. So you can imagine person on the left typing something and on the right person reading with uh, you know right wing new filter and they will see completely two completely different <laughs> body of text. So this is very scary. But on the other hand, this is kind of thing we have currently, but it's not formula formalized. So as I said before, now you people from with, from two different ideologies see the one word which is abortion and the two persons the thing completely different, they have completely different things in in their mind. So you could formalize, you could try to formalize this and, you know, make this functions like explicit and 
now we are going to the, the, the end, the end. And now you can wrap it even more and say like how discussions would look like if you could, if you, you know, have, uh, <laughs> you, you, you would have, uh, if you have such a filter like this, like would arguing make sense? Like arguing would be so obvious. Like, I mean, arguing this, you know, low level, like low, like, uh, not like intellectually stimulating discussion about politics. Like they could be easily, my hypothesis is that they could be easily reduced to this kind of font, which, you know, automatically replace ugly to not traditionally beautiful, blurs the words that the other, per the, the, some speakers don't like and so on and so on. So maybe then uh, the new kind of debates would emerge, which would be, you know, actually speaking about language. So look, like in my vocabulary, when you say this thing, I hear this phrase, like this is what I actually hear, like what I actually feel when I hear what you are talking about. So you, you could have these things explicit. I think this could make uh, discussions uh, easier. Uh, yeah, so maybe another example of, so you could also, so you could, uh, see, you know, think about like a func more functions, like how to move from one vocabulary to another and where, like, where are isomorphisms? Like if there, in what vocabularies you can go to and then back and go and stay with the same place when no information is lost. So I think this would be, this is, this interests me. This like makes, like, I want, uh, I want to see it happening. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, maybe another example, because I think it might be a bit confusing. So context, Alex wants to use gender, ne gender neutral pronouns. Unfortunately, they aren't used to them yet. Moreover, they think it would be funny to change some occurrence of like to use to. They have read about the mere exposure effect recently. Alex is also a fan of satirical novels. Input is what they write in the diary. So here's the input. Yesterday, Sophie was cooking a dinner for everybody. She prepared traditional dishes. I like them so much. They are from my country. And the output, so the output is what this filter, what this kind of font, which not only, you know, changes the words like ugly to not traditionally beautiful, but it's much, much more advanced could, could uh, display. Yesterday, Sophie was cooking dinner for everybody. So this is unchanged. This is like very neutral, like it's hard to, to you know, to change anything there, but you could like, if you want to. They, so you, you see that the vocab, the, the filter changed she today, Prepare traditional dishes. Like this is also like generic. You could actually implement uh, the Dipolai type is the open source, so you could actually try to implement this right away. And now it's now now the funny part. So it so the filter changed. I like them so much. They are from my country too. I am used to them so much. They are from my grandfather. <laughs> so first thing it changed the filter change. It's like to used to. And the second thing is that the filter changed country to Grand Falun. So uh, as, as it was in the context, the Alex likes uh, satirical novels. So they read uh, Kurt Vonnegut. And the Grand Falun is a word from, uh, for, from Kurt Vonnegut books. And it means uh, uh, Grand Falun, none group in which meaning is established by a virtue of being in that group, probably as a result of the random process. So you see that it would, the, such a tool would be also a, could be also used in creative ways. Like somebody has read uh, Kurt Vonnegut and wants to implement this language to their use. So they can just, you know, go to openfilters.com and org and, and 
just download and apply the card phone goods filter and see what some phrases would be changed to uh, if they write like normal stuff. <laughs> All right, so this, this was the intense part. Uh, I think that this is the end. I have uh, nothing to add. So thank you for for participating. And now I'm uh, waiting for comments. Yeah. Thank you, Camille. Thank you very much. This was interesting and uh, way more complex than expected. <laughs> um, I think we have mm. a few minutes or seconds to go for a question. I think I have a question here from the internet. Oh. Um, it's linked to your like Let's example. Go. It's a little bit like a comment. Uh, maybe because it would take more time. The question is: Could you explain the widely used uh, word "like" in in sentences like um, "It's just like your opinion, man"? So it, it's part of it. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's to like. Yes. Something. Yes, yes, yes. Sure, sure. So this, uh, as far as I understand, this means like like as, as something similar so uh so obviously we don't like change something similar to the phrase used to uh this was like implicitly uh so like sure we don't want to change uh, this we meant only with this sympathy meaning of mm -hmm. this word yeah it was more like a discussion point with maybe some more uh, occurrences like this one uh, used as part of a complete sentence mm -hmm. uh, Okay, uh, one more question. It's uh, a little yes. link to your polite type example because it looks to be very complex. And the question is um, playing with words in other languages. So localizing content is a very complex problem and it is often used completely misleading translations. So have you seen other groups like yours playing with words or uh, could your group be starting point to get more information how to avoid these mistakes? Uh, um, sorry, I, I it was a bit jacked. Uh, okay. You can contact me uh, with this mail because uh, I don't know how much time we have. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, we also well. think about this. Yeah, it's what about your, your group and if you maybe a good starting point for other resources. And yes, uh, you can join us. You can you can yeah. you can uh, okay. send me an email and I basically send you all the links and invite to the group okay. and introduce you to the group. So everybody okay. are welcome. <laughs> Okay, Camille, I think that's that's all for now. So I hope you enjoyed your first talk at the Congress and you will hope, uh, hopefully have more. So next time we'll see you in person uh, in Leipzig again. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you very, very much. Thank Cheers. you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye now.